Okay, I think we can we can already start. So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Selectives and Iceberg Data Lab webinar. I'm Maria Seifert, working with uh, Selectives Marketing Initiatives. I'll be hosting this webinar. So uh, in today's panel, we'll discuss how index investors can promote biodiversity preservation. The idea of the panel is to provide you with valuable insights about uh, two of the most pressing issues of our time, exploring the interplay between climate change and biodiversity loss. So let me introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we have Mathieu Mohan. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Iceberg Data Lab. Mathieu started his career in the energy industry at Electricité de France. Subsequently, he worked at uh, BNP Paribas, where he worked for more than 10 years in various positions. And then he became a CEO of Carbon for Finance, and then finally became a CEO and co-founder of Iceberg Data Lab. Uh, from Selective side, uh, we have Javier Almeida. Javier is a researcher at Selective, specializing in ESG. Previously, he worked as an investment manager at Allianz Investment Management. On behalf of Selective and Iceberg Data Lab, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, I hope you have an insightful time today with our guests. And uh, at the end of this session, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you have questions during the presentations, please send us written via the Q&A button. So uh, I would ask you to please avoid the chat button, but use the Q&A button probably at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we will uh, read the questions out loud in the end and they will be answered. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone, Javier, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the kind intro. Maria, uh, first, uh, thank you to each of uh, the people of the persons that managed to join the presentation. First off, I'd like to give those who don't know Selective uh, a bit of an intro to the company. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see that uh, basically Selective is a German headquartered indexing company that is not necessarily uh, characterized by us having a big flagship index, but what we are characterized for is by being flexible, by being fast to come to market, and it's by um, offering competitive price to our clients. Um, and basically, this flexibility doesn't only reflect uh, to uh, different to the different um, our parts of indexing, but it also is the case for the ESG space. Um, so if we go to the next slide, Maria. Uh, so basically, just as in quantitative, just as in thematics, um, in ESG, we are characterized by our flexibility and basically by our open architecture model when it comes to ESG data points. That enables us to, base, to work with any sort of data point our client wants us to use um, due to the fact that we have strong partnerships with many kinds of ESG data providers, as well with um, strategic partners, among which is Minerva Analytics that specializes in governance, as well as Right based on science and spark change that are more on the climate side of things as well as Iceberg Data Lab that uh, Mathieu will now introduce to all of you. Thank you, uh, Javier. Nice uh, meeting you all and thank you, Selective, for that uh, opportunity uh, to present uh, our data solution and, and a concrete uh, illustration of, uh, of uh, their added value in terms of uh, building uh, a sound uh, signal. First of all, who we are, we are a fintech. Uh, we were uh, created uh, three years ago, headquartered in Paris, but uh, with now offices in uh, Frankfurt and in London. And uh, we developed a data platform, an ESG data platform. Uh, I will explain you a bit more later on how we work and how we do that. Um, our purpose is to provide financial institutions with the tools that they need to integrate ESG into their decision-making process, which maybe provide a reporting uh, compliant, 
with uh, what the regulation is uh, asking, which may be for research purpose, and you will see an illustration of that uh, today, which may be to uh, develop investment product and strategies, which, uh, with, uh, which is what uh, we've done and uh, we will continue to do with, uh, with uh, Selective our, as our strategic, uh, one of our strategic uh, partners. Uh, we are an independent company headquartered in Paris. Uh, and in terms of governance, uh, we work only for financial institutions and not for issuers to be free of any conflict of interest. Basically, we are positioned on the investor services uh, side of the business. On the next slide, you have a, a flavor of uh, our uh, uh, franchise, uh, some of our clients, which, as you know, as you see, cover a broad range of uh, major uh, asset owner and asset manager with a variety of, uh, of approaches to ESG, I would say some very quantitative, some uh, very qualitative, um, other, uh, other uh, financial services uh, company, uh, index provider and so on, platforms. And we do provide also data to uh, companies uh, having or developing or investing into real asset or in private equity. On the next slide, I will go, uh, I will show you uh, an overview of our um, range of services, basically three different thematics, uh, biodiversity, climate, and uh, holistic green scores, and, and three different uh, main services, which are uh, reporting, data and data solution, and uh, ESG softwares. On the next slide, and I will spend a, a, a bit more time on that one because it will explain you basically how we proceed and how we approach data provision, data modeling to provide financial institution with a signal which is based on science first and second scalable and capable of covering broad range of issuers, asset class, and so on and so on. The bulk of our activity uh, of our model is a physical input-output model, which is symbolized by a nice uh, moving uh, octopus, which, which is uh, uh, an image of the broad array of sources that uh, we browse to build, to get input, allow us to model what the company are doing, what is the performance of their processes? What is the performance of the product? What is their supply chain? That is the difference between the way we can approach ESG modeling now and the way and what was possible 15 years ago. It is the ocean of data, structured and unstructured, which allow us to go quite far into capturing and modeling what the company are doing. This model, and it is a proprietary model for that reason, is very granular because we developed uh, analysis at product or services level in order to cover above 2,000 different product and services. That level of granularity reflects, for instance, the level of granularity of the EU green taxonomy, which doesn't tell you if a company is aligned or not on the green taxonomy based on sector, based, based on very granular technical criteria, such as the number of grams of CO2 that you release to produce one kilo of cement. Meaning you have a serious, you must have serious data collection and calculation capacity, and you should have an environmental research and modeling team. And so here we work on two legs with a team of sectoral experts with a team of, uh, of uh, thematic experts, which basically run life cycle analysis on that product flow matrix. So what you should represent is have we go from what the company is doing from a financial standpoint, environmental standpoint, or based on its environmental report. And then we built a flow matrix, which will allow us to calculate or model the level of pollution or consumption of resources that that company has based on its activity. 
Once you have done, you can calculate a carbon footprint. You can calculate the level of nitrogen, sulfur, uh, waste, pollutant, and so on, released by the company in the soil, in the air, or in the water. And so you can aggregate that in a signal, which is a biodiversity footprint, which is our, our biodiversity footprinting solution, the CBF, Corporate Biodiversity Footprint, using a metric put in the public domain and developed since uh, 30 years uh, by the Dutch Environmental Agency, PBL, which is a square kilometer MSA, which is a surface unit, which is to biodiversity, what ton of CO2 equivalent is to climate, and which is an equivalent artificialization level due to the company business related to its size or related to the intensity of its pollution. On top and in parallel of that, we calculate several scores, green share, temperature, and so on and so on. But what you should have in mind is that we have a carbon footprint, which is a quite known concept now, and we have a biodiversity footprint, which is built in parallel and, and with exactly the same kind of approach. You respond to the question, what the company is doing, and therefore, what is the level of pollution of the company? And therefore, it is translated in a metric, which is a surface unit, and which allow to quantify an impact on biodiversity and have a footprinting approach, which is needed uh, to uh, manage basically the impact of several corporates in the same sector within portfolio. Javier. Thanks a lot, uh, Mathieu. Um, and basically, uh, we all know how grave is climate change for life on Earth and the threat that it poses to us. However, have you ever wondered if this same level of urgency tra translates to biodiversity? And when many people think about biodiversity, you think of probably the latest trip you did to Africa or to the Amazon rain jungle in which you managed to see both beautiful um, animals and beautiful flora that are completely foreign to things you've ever seen before. So in a way, you could say that biodiversity is actually one of the most important things uh, that makes life beautiful to us. However, what many people are not aware of is that healthy ecosystems are an essential part uh, for life on Earth. Basically, um, the uh, ecosystem services, as well as nature's multiple other contributions, are essential for uh, societies to exist. And in fact, researchers have estimated that the contribution of only ecosystem services, uh, only them, attribute to trillions of US dollars annually to the global economy. However, even though uh, biodiversity is not only important uh, from the financial perspective for the world um, and uh, to uh, our, our overall day to day, um, we as humans have neglected its importance, which is reflected by the Global Living Planet Index, which indicates that over the past 50 years, global measured biodiversity has decreased by around 70%. What this means is that the world is only 30% as biodiverse right now, as it used to be 50 years ago, which um, should be a cause for concern for many people. And if we go to the next slide, we'll be able to see one of the main reasons for this. And also one of the main reasons why many organizations claim that climate change and biodiversity loss are a twin crisis. This is due to the fact that forest policy both drives climate change and reduces the amount of biodiversity on Earth. Just to put it into context, change in land in use was estimated to be the main driver of human-made by the biodiversity loss, which is very concerning given the fact that ever since the start of the century, so from 2000 on, the amount of tree cover loss globally has more than doubled. And this has been particularly concentrated in the tropics. And the other reason why tropical tree cover loss is such so concerning for, uh, for the world um, maybe even more so than in other parts of the world, is that tropical tree cover loss is uh, 
Basically, you can attribute 97%, 96% of global permanent deforestation to the trees that are lost in the tropics. Because unlike in boreal forests, uh, for example, or other kinds of forests, um, in which a lot of the deforestation is attributed to wildfires or forestry policy, a lot of the, uh, the land that's cleared around the tropics um, basically is used for other aspects such as, for example, livestock that not only decrease the amount of, of, of trees that can sequester carbon and other greenhouse gases, but also uh, basically are then occupied by livestock that on top of that generate other greenhouse gases on earth. Um, so therefore, even though tropica, um, tropical trees are still um, the trees that remove the most amount of carbon worldwide, as you can see in the, in the chart in the bottom left, um, and the tropics is also where the most amount of emissions um, occur relative to other kinds of forests. Um, just to put it into perspective, this translates uh, uh, this translated to around 5.5 gigatons of emissions uh, on average, only, on only attributable, attributable to tropical tree cover loss between 2001 and 2021, which is a pretty large number. Um, however, if we go to the next slide, um, you will see that even though this 5.5 gigatons of, emission, of emissions are very, very material, um, if you put them into, into the context of global emissions, you'll see that they only represent around 17% 17 of, um, of the total emissions over this time period. And if we were to assume that this year will completely stop deforesting the tropics, and therefore, not only we will not emit this 5.5 gigatons, but on top of that, all the trees that are not deforested are also used to sequester carbon. And therefore, um, basically, we managed to decrease global emissions by around 11 gigatons, so 5.5 times 2. Um, this would only decrease global emissions by around a third. So therefore, even though forestry policy is greatly important for us to achieve the goal of net zero, it's only one part of a greater puzzle. Um, even though forestry policy is um, the main driver of global biodiversity loss. So therefore, we may claim that the main driver of global biodiversity uh, loss is uh, not the same driver of climate change, even though these two crises are uh, very deeply linked to one another. Um, and basically this fact, uh, is reflected by Iceberg Data Labs data, which we can see on the next slide. So basically, um, based on its data, we were able to determine that uh, the overall biodiversity impact of developed markets, uh, large, uh, large companies, so basically companies with market capitalization, capitalization of over $10 billion. Uh, so for these companies, um, change of land use um, contributes to around 70% of their overall negative biodiversity impact, which you can see on the bubble charts and in this particular slide. So basically, you can see four bubble charts, which uh, basically represent um, the absolute uh, negative biodiversity impact that the companies of our, studio uni of, our, of our study universe have on biodiversity, and how their negative impact can be attributed to either change of land use, water pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and air pollution. Essentially, each of these bubbles represents um, a company, and the size of the bubble represents how negative is their impact to global biodiversity. And how up is a bubble uh, when it comes to the y-axis um, basically means how much of this negative impact can be attributed to one of these four factors. And as you can see in the highlighted bit of the change of land use um, graph, most of the volume when it comes to bubble size can um, of, of, of the companies. So it, it's further up for companies that have a lot of biodiversity impact attributable to change of land use, which means that um, based on Iceberg's uh, data labs data, you can see that the, uh, that listed equities tend to uh, affect biodiversity loss the most because of their their land use policy, which is then followed by water pollution and then uh, by greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution by a much lesser 
degree. Based, that, uh, based on this data, um, we wanted to then conduct a, an, an, an experiment within a portfolio context, which you'll see on the next slide. So basically, given that we have our, uh, our universe of uh, large developed market companies, we wanted to see how we can uh, how we can do a portfolio that minimizes a weight deviation from a market capitalization weighted benchmark uh, by applying different constraints. So first, we tried to see um, how this optimizer reduced uh, carbon emissions and carbon intensity, which is emissions divided by company's enterprise value, by around 50%. Additionally, in a second optimization, we try to see the same, but instead of constraining carbon emissions, we try to constrain the company's biodiversity footprint. And then lastly, we applied the last optimization in which we try to constrain both emissions and biodiversity footprint. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a bit the intuition behind the results that I'll elaborate upon in a bit. So given the fact that the drivers of climate change and biodiversity loss are not fully intertwined, then you can imagine that there can be a trade-off um, when it comes to the companies that affect more one of these dimensions than the other. And for our particular exercise, um, you can assume that if, for example, your goal is to reduce the emissions or biodiversity impact of your portfolio by a little bit, then you can basically just remove the low hanging fruits of your portfolio. By this, I mean the companies that are not necessarily that large, but have a very disproportionately high either emissions or biodiversity footprint. However, the higher the impact you want to have, the more uh, these, let's say, low hanging fruits stop to exist and you start to have to deviate more and more of your portfolio on an, or in other words, um, getting higher and higher active weights, which basically means the deviations from the market capitalization portfolio. So therefore, if you want to focus on reducing emissions to a considerable degree, then your active weights will be a bit higher than if you didn't. And if you want to uh, focus on biodiversity loss and reduce the biodiversity footprint of your portfolio, basically you could also expect moderate active weights. Whereas due to the fact that the drivers of biodiversity loss and climate change are not the same, if you want to focus on the two things at the same time, you can expect even higher active weights. Um, so basically this is the intuition behind the portfolio optimization exercise that we did. And in the next slide, you can see actually how this reflects in practice. So basically on the emissions constraint portfolio, we realized that um, we did manage to, uh, to reach our desired level of emissions um, with moderately high active weights, but at the same time, uh, the biodiversity footprint reduction that we saw was of only 18%. Whereas on the second optimization that we did, uh, we observed that the biodiversity constraint portfolio actually reduced emissions by even more than uh, its emissions counterpart uh, when it comes to biodiversity impact. So basically it reduced emissions by 29%, which is uh, very interesting at the cost of then again, a bit higher active weight. And lastly, uh, the um, optimization that constrained both emissions and biodiversity footprint was the one that experienced the higher active weight. If we go to the next slide, we'll uh, realize a bit the intuition behind uh, this optimization. So you'll see that the emissions constrained portfolio mostly focused on divesting from companies in the energy sector, because of course, these are the companies that produce the largest degree of greenhouse gas um, emissions. So therefore, you can see that out of the five companies that I've highlighted in the slide, uh, the top four are uh, big oil uh, companies. So Saudi Aramco, Chevron, Total, and BP. Whereas uh, what's very interesting is that in the middle of the slide, you'll see that the biodiversity constraint portfolio focused more on companies whose value chain rely on changing uh, land a lot. Um, such as, for example, Amazon, uh, but most interesting, uh, at least from my perspective, companies such as uh, Walmart or PepsiCo uh, that, require on, uh, that require heavily on agriculture in order to bring to the supermarkets the staples that we consume for them. So therefore, the most underweight sector in the biodiversity constraint portfolio actually um, was the consumer services sector. 
Whereas in the uh, last optimization, we observed that there was a mix. Um, overall, the optimization chose to divest both from uh, big oil companies and from consumer oriented companies. Um, and even though the most divested uh, sector was energy, um, the company that contributed the most to biodiversity um, impact reduction was the consumer services sector again. Um, so therefore, given that I've elaborated a bit on these use cases for icebergs uh, car, uh, corporate biodiversity footprint, on the next slide, you'll see how index investors can actually use this data for index construction. So basically among the ways in which investors can use this data uh, in an index investing context is for example, um, one, one case in point would be the minimal tracking error portfolio that I elaborated upon in this, in this case study that I just explained. Um, another use case would be to do a universe screening uh, based on a company's biodiversity impact. Um, and this is the case, uh, for example, for the indices composed, uh, composing the um, selective biodiversity screen index series, um, um, among which some of these indices have already actually been licensed to Societe Generale. And lastly, a, a more active approach to tackle biodiversity loss um, through icebergs data is for more of a shareholder um, point of view in which basically investors can choose to invest in companies with the highest carbon footprint, sorry, uh, sorry biodiversity footprint, and basically incentivize them to uh, take on policies uh, that are less harmful for global nature. Um, so basically from a more uh, shareholder uh, or oriented or driven approach. So to conclude, um, if we go to the last uh, slide of the main part of the presentation, even though biodiversity loss and climate change are linked, um, change uh, in land use is not the main driver in rising emissions. Therefore, uh, for investors to effectively tackle either of these two crises, um, they must rely on uh, targeted solutions um, that basically are built upon um, data that's actually suited for purpose and tailored for either of these two particular crises. Basi and basically, iceberg data labs can help bridge this gap, both for emissions and biodiversity impact. Um, so I'll hand over back to Maria, um, but thanks a lot for, for, um, uh, for paying attention throughout the presentation. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, uh, Mati, as well, for the very interesting presentations. Uh, it was very nice hearing about the proprietary model of Iceberg and also the optimization on the portfolios. Very insightful. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so we will have now a Q&A session. Um, sorry, to inspire, we chose this uh, nice picture. Um, yeah, so we have one question here. Yes, so um, the question is, has the methodology of the biodiversity footprint model been validated by a third party organization? That's for me, I guess. Thank you for your question. Uh, so the answer is yes, we have a, a scientific governance meaning that we have a scientific committee and, and he met just yesterday. Uh, we, we, we have uh, um, three meetings a year with them, uh, with independent uh, representative uh, from uh, WWF, um, from uh, MNHN, which is the French Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle. Uh, so the French Conservancy, Conservancy Museum, uh, which is spreading uh, research uh, action on, on this uh, domain, and other uh, independent uh, consultant uh, specialized in the firm, uh, and the, uh, the, the chief of research, let's say, of pre consulting from the Netherlands. Their role is not to, to certify nor even to validate the methodological approach. It, it's not what you can ask for to person with, a, with a, an academic uh, working for academics. 
but it's more to provide us uh, support on, on two points. Very important one. The first one is that we are using state of the art uh, resourcing uh, in our model. Uh, so I evoked our model earlier and say that we translate uh, water pollution into a square, into a metric impact expressed in a square kilometer of equivalent artificialization. This is derived from academic studies. And so we have uh, an internal uh, modeling team with uh, an head of uh, research. Uh, we make sure through that governance that we are using state-of-the-art model. Second, last but not least, we ask them to confirm us that the signal that we provide steers the, the investors and provides them a compass steering in the right direction, meaning that the hierarchy of impact of sectors, company, product, is sound, and is aligned with what IPBES is telling us about the main contributor and the main driver to biodiversity loss. That is ultimately the way we can, uh, we can uh, backtest basically the model and making sure that it is uh, uh, based on, uh, on state-of-the-art uh, science. So for that scientific committee, uh, we make sure that uh, our approach is, uh, is uh, robust. Thank you, Mati. I have uh, one more question here. As far as I understood, the IDL methodology, the biodiversity footprints, uh, seems to only capture negative impacts. Is there any plan to include positive impact of the companies on biodiversity in the future? I have a hunch that uh, we will have a, a similar webinar with, uh, with uh, Javier. Uh, this time uh, using indeed a new data set, which is a positive impact metric, because indeed uh, we, we just uh, developed dependency indicators first. So which is to biodiversity, what physical risk is to climate, meaning to which extent biodiversity loss has an impact on your business. And indeed a new set of indicators, which are positive impact indicator, mirroring what we do and what we are familiar with in on climate, which is the companies which reshuffle their process to reduce their impact. First, KPI, positive KPI, hopefully. Second, uh, the way that company change its product and, and therefore the fact that this product have a lower impact uh, on biodiversity than equivalent product on the market, which may be a uh, plastic free uh, bags, uh, packaging and so on and so on, for instance, so that's avoided impact. And last but not least, direct investment into a land conservation, land rehabilitation action, which generate biodiversity credit. And we will calculate all of them separately and, uh, and aggregate them in a positive impact uh, indicator, yes. Thank you. And one more for you, Mathieu. Um, I think you mentioned the use of databases for your models. Apart from financial data, what kind of environmental databases you've been relying on? We, we basically rely on, on either uh, uh, public uh, or, uh, or, or, or um, uh, open source, I mean, or published by company environmental data. Uh, which depending on the sector may be more or less extensive, but when generally you are in material sector, they are expensive, they are extensive, excuse me, uh, which provide us with basically raw information about the level of pollutants released by the company, nitrogen, sulfur, GHG, and so on, and so on, and so on. That a part of it is uh, structured and unstructured data that, that we capture. Other one are uh, publicly available uh, resources, uh, such as uh, what is being published by EIA, FAO, uh, and, and other resources uh, like that. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I think we just have one more uh, logistics question. 
Uh, will the slides be provided? Um, are you two providing, making it available anywhere? No. Um, if if anyone is uh, interested in the slides, um, if it's okay with you, Matthew, they can uh, reach out to us directly and we can yes, yes. send them over. Absolutely. Perfect. And here are the contacts. As uh, Javier mentioned, you can uh, reach out directly to either him uh, or Mathieu or anyone here in these charts. And uh, also here for Iceberg. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank you too very much. And also on behalf of uh, Selective and on Iceberg, I'd like to thank you everyone that uh, followed the webinar until now. Um, also would like to let you know that uh, the webinar is going to be available in a few days on our YouTube channel, on Selective's YouTube channel, and we will also uh, post it on our LinkedIn page. Uh, so if you don't follow us, please uh, make sure that you follow us so you also receive um, our newest uh, research uh, papers and our partnership with Iceberg News and uh, so on. Also on our website, Selective's website, we have the uh, research material, so you can download papers and all uh, our research material there. Um, yes, so thank you very much. Um, I think that's it. So I hope to, I hope you had an insightful time and I hope to see you next time in the next webinar. Thank you, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.